Hey everybody, Carmen and Ian here today to talk about a um, comment that I made on a recent Mike Winger video. For those of you who don't know Mike Winger, love Mike Winger. How do you feel about Mike Winger, Ian? I haven't followed him as closely as you and Jeff have, but I like what I've seen of him. Yes, yes. He's a very good Bible teacher. Um, rarely disagree with Mike Winger. He's very, like, uh, nice, too. Like, he's very, um, like, very well studied and makes very good cases, but he also comes across as very um, agreeable and friendly, which I don't know that all Bible teachers do that. Many of them do, but Mike Winger does a very good job. But there is this video that he made and i'm just going to play the video for everyone so they could see it let's be submissive Here and comes. great citizens in china they're actually reprinting altered versions of bible stories to put in their governmental like propaganda literature so that it makes it look like jesus is telling them to obey china no matter what in the chinese government version of the woman caught in adultery jesus picks up stones and kills the woman himself because the Chinese government saw this subversion of law as a threat. It's weird stuff that's going on there. You know, most countries that persecute their Christian populations would find that if those are godly Christians, they're going to be the best citizens. They might think Jesus is somehow, I mean, there are countries who really do. They think serving Jesus is a threat to the obedience to the government. But in all reality, like we are taught to be submissive in most scenarios to governments. Of course, not when they're asking you to go murder people or something, right? But to be submissive and be great citizens. All right. So that's the video. I will be interested in your thoughts, Ian, but I made a comment on the video that ended up getting a lot of likes and comments um, because on the one hand, I do agree with what Mike Winger is saying. Christians do tend to make very good citizens because Christians have a ethical code that allows for human flourishing when followed. Um, Christians also believe they're accountable to God, which makes it more likely to follow that code, the other motivators. Um, but I don't know. I think the way that Mike Winger framed this almost makes it sound like governments don't have a reason to view Christians as a threat. And I think that authoritarian Governments know that Christians are very uh, problematic to their goals. And so I, I said something along the lines of Christians are a threat to authoritarian governments because Christ commands his followers to pursue goodness and justice. And those work and those governments work to undermine both of those things. Um, sadly, most governments expand and become authoritarian over time, even if they started off you know, good um, over time. It's just kind of the nature of things. So Christians almost always find themselves in the difficult position of having to make significant relational and political sacrifices in the short term, or they, they're going to be persecuted in the long term. And a lot of people seem to agree with that. You and I have had conversations about this. So I would just love your take on all of that. Ian, what are, you, what are your thoughts on Mike Wigger's little vignette here? Well, my sort of general background that I have when I come to these questions is throughout the entirety of first the Bible and then church history, there is this very central recurring theme of the chief antagonist of the people of God being centralized, powerful states, especially sort of cosmopolitan centralized states. And the people of God are called on to affirmatively defy, restrain, and overcome centralized governmental power again and again. From the judges, the period of the judges, this happens multiple times from the Moabites to the Canaanites to Gideon fighting the Midianites. It happens throughout the, the great empires of Daniel 2 and Daniel chapter 7, the Persian Empire, the Seleucid Empire, there's of course a revolution, the Maccabean Revolt, the Roman Empire, Christians are, as the church expands, involved in defying and eventually involved in affirmatively through battle, overcoming pagan Roman imperial authority. And then throughout, say, just the Middle Ages, you've got Christians organized as the church playing a really critical role in checking and restraining the power of secular states from Ambrose of Milan, the mentor of Augustine, going back to antiquity a bit, but he kind of established this pattern through famous stories like Gregory the Seventh, 
uh, defying Henry IV. So this is the entire story, basically, of how the people of God, as they start in this little corner of the Levant and spread throughout the world, interact with human authority. You know, I can and I could give examples in modernity that people would be maybe more familiar with, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Mm-hmm. But Bonhoeffer saw himself as just, and he was walking in this really long tradition of Christian disobedience to, and in some cases, revolution against governmental power. Mm-hmm. So, against that backdrop, somehow people have managed to make a few verses in Romans 13 stand as the sort of be all end all of Christian engagement with politics. It's not even all Paul says about politics. There's an entire chapter of Paul talking about politics in 1 Corinthians 6 uh, that is not as convenient for the absolutist authoritarian position, but somehow people don't quote 1 Corinthians 6 as much. You hear people just mention Romans 13 as if it's a a showstopper, Romans 13, period. (laughs) But those people couldn't even tell you what's in First Corinthians six. Sometimes, right. more and, more scrutiny is needed on Romans. People like to take right. things from Romans and just be like, "And there you go." <laughs> and you're like, "Well, yeah, yeah. hold on, though. Wait, there's other there's other words in the Bible as well." And so that's kind of in the background here with what Mike Winger says. Most of what he says is sort of technically, semantically correct. I mean, yeah, the the standard is you should be a law abiding citizen, but when he says something like, unless they tell you to murder people, I get the sense that he's sort of taking this Romans 13 absolutism that, uh, you know, takes that as sort of the be all end all of Christian engagement with politics. And he's kind of assuming that as a default, maybe. Uh, mm-hmm. And that may not be his fault. I think, you know, a lot of contemporary Christians just sort of assume that that's the default position. And if they haven't really thought a lot about this question, then they just start from this premise of, I basically need to always obey the government, whatever the government says, unless it's a direct command to sin, in which case I can passively disobey, or a direct command to renounce Christ, in, in which case I, of course, disobey that. Right. But of course, none of that is in Romans 13. <laughs> right. This, yeah. It, it is interesting that you say that because I've had quite a few conversations with people who they're hesitant to believe Christianity or look into Christianity because they believe that Christianity is a way to simply kind of like pacify people into being more compliant to power structures or something, whether they think that's the church or they think that's the government um, depends on the person. And what's so interesting is historically, There's nothing that really suggests that devout Christians follow power structures, like that they are compliant to corrupt or authoritarian power structures. So maybe the disconnect is just people know so little about history and this particular kind of like, maybe I'm wrong about this, but isn't isn't this idea that, you know, religion is this opiate that was popularized by Marx? Is that right? I'm thinking that's right. I don't know. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. Marx referred to religion as the yes. opiate of the Nazis. Yeah. And so maybe it's just this sort of like, this is more influential than we realize, even among Christians. I don't know if that rings true yeah, to you. Well, Marx called religion the opiate of the masses, but Rousseau, who was sort of mm. Marx's predecessor in church state relations said you have to start by destroying christianity because it is a threat to the centralized omnipotent state we want to create to to restructure society in the way we want so rousseau sort of correctly intuited that christianity was a threat and that's why you know jacobins as soon as they had power started exterminating christians but just sociologically you know if you wanted to run a tyrannical government I would think you would maybe want a Buddhist population. When has there been a Buddhist holy war against an oppressive government? Or you would maybe want an atheist population. The the atheist population of the Soviet Union obeyed the Soviet Union. There was no, you know, big grassroots revolution against atheistic Chinese communist rule. The, The atheists in Jacobin France just sort of, we call it the French Revolution, but they just seized power in a coup and then they oppressed people from the top down. It was the Christians 
who revolted and fought a revolution in the Vendée. Christians are like, you know, I, I guess you could say maybe ancient Jews, Christians, and Muslims together are kind of the the least, mm. you, you know, able to be pacified people on the planet. Um, yeah. So it does yeah, not seem true. like Christianity or kind of our broader monotheistic heritage has really done anything to sort of pacify people and make them compliant. The criticism you raised, that was probably my main critique of Christianity as an anti-Christian teenager. And I realized it was wrong when I was 17. I didn't even know all the stories we've been talking about, but I just realized intuitively, if you wanted to make up a worldview that would get people to obey oppressive authority, you would not make up Christianity because you wouldn't want a personal God transcending all human authority because that God is always going to override human authority when it screws up. And, you know, sociologically, in fact, we see who who are the peoples that are more obedient to tyrannical governments. You can have kind of nihilistic religions where you strive for non-being and emptiness and nirvana, or you can have atheism that seems to be, that seems to do a pretty good job making people obedient, uh, but Christianity does not. Yep. So I think, yeah, I think we've probably pinpointed what influences this conversation. It's this like lingering Marxist little dig at religion that doesn't have really much evidence to support it. It's Romans 13 taken out of its whole context and hyper focused on this idea that maybe, yeah, maybe a good way to sort of wrap up this conversation and give people some application is how would you if someone was struggling with Romans 13 if they read that and they thought well obviously from this I need to obey the government in all circumstances how would you challenge them to yeah so two points to make about Romans 13 so Romans 13 just straightforwardly says you know obey the governing authorities because the government desires your good the government does not punish good conduct, it punishes evil conduct, and it rewards good conduct. So therefore, obey the governing authorities. There aren't then a series of qualifications, right? Paul does not say, uh, however, in A, these are the exceptions, A, B, and C. So obey the government absolutely, unless you get into A, B, or C situations. Now, the thing is, the people who think they're absolutists about Romans 13, and Probably the best example of this is like old John MacArthur. You know, who who knows what MacArthur says now? He's he clearly does not hold to his old Romans 13 absolutism because of everything that happened during COVID. Uh, he obviously changed his position, but he used to be kind of the main proponent of. I mean, he would say, if you were a, a Christian in the Soviet Union, you basically you need to unconditionally obey Stalin, unless you know, of course, if Stalin says renounce Christ, you don't do that. But otherwise, obey Stalin. Uh, the American Revolution, you know, was was wrong. The Americans should have just unconditionally submitted to the governing authorities unless the British said to renounce Christ or something. That used to be John MacArthur's position. But even those people, those Romans 13 absolutists, they're not absolutist about it. Because again, they'll come up with at least one exception. They'll at least say, well, if they tell you to renounce Christ, don't do that. Ah, right. right. And again, that's not in the chapter that we're talking about. That's not in Romans 13. They're inferring that from other stuff Paul has written. And then probably they'd infer some other things. Like if they, if you're commanded to murder, you know, don't, don't do that. You, you at least passively disobey. So there's a, there's a question here then about, you know, what are the circumstances in which you disobey government? Everyone agrees. Romans 13 is not the be all end all. Everyone agrees. It is a norm and there are certain exceptions to it. And so the absolutist is just saying that they think it's a natural interpretation of Romans 13, that you need to unconditionally obey unless A, B, C, uh, basically passively resist if you're commanded to renounce Christ or you're commanded to sin. And the alternative is something like what I just outlined, that the default way you conduct yourself as an individual is to obey the law, you should be a law abiding person and a good citizen. But the fact is that sociologically and as a matter of the eschatolo eschatological drama of God's people throughout the Bible and throughout history, the church corporately is often going to be engaged in a way that affirmatively, not just passively, affirmatively limits the power of the government to oppress and restrains and sometimes overcomes and, and casts off that power. 
that's happened again and again and again. And and if you you know take the Bible seriously, it's been ordained by God again and again and again. And so the the absolutist is just saying they think their you know very particular interpretation is somehow more intuitive than the latter interpretation. When when it comes to the actual text of Romans 13, we both agree this is a norm. And it doesn't apply in all situations. And we just disagree on what those situations are. And again, Romans 13 can't tell us what those situations are by itself because it, there's no exceptions enumerated there mm-hmm. unless you you kind of draw out sort of the implications of the chapter. And maybe the best way to illustrate this is this is a common argument. I certainly didn't invent this. But if you just replace Romans 13 with parents and children, and you say, you know, obey your parents. Parents are, they're there to reward the good. They're out there to punish the good. They reward good and they punish evil, right? If you just replaced it word for word with children, obey your parents, no one would arrive at the absolutist position. No one would say, oh, Paul's saying, obey my parents unconditionally. Even if there's parental sexual abuse going on, I need to submit to that. If my sibling's being sexually abused, I need to submit to that. Uh, I just, I the only things that I should disobey are if my parents actively command me to sin, I should refrain from actively sinning, or if they actively command me to renounce Christ, I should passively refrain from doing that. But no, by no means, if my parents are doing any unjust or oppressive thing, I will take no action to correct them. If, again, if, Romans 13 read exactly as it does now, but we just put in parents and children. No one would think that was what Romans 13 was. <laughs> right. If right. Romans, someone was preaching for Romans 13 and they said that was the interpretation, people would say, where are you get? None of this is in here. It does, with right. submitting to parental, I have to let my sibling be sexually abused. I can't, I can't physically stop my parents. That's nothing in here says that. Where are you getting that? Right. So I think right. that just shows the absolutist interpretation is just not the natural interpretation of Romans 13, it's just been sort of beaten into people by repetition. Mm -hmm. And so they assume it's a natural reading when you you wouldn't get it if you were just starting with the text. It's certainly not in context of that kind of entire drama that we just spoke about. Well, and as you're saying that, I'm just thinking, if you are even familiar with even just some of the stories of the Bible, it wouldn't be natural for you to think that the proper way of being for a godly person is to be very passive in the face of government oppression. Like if you just think about Jesus, <laughs> number one, like there's really Jesus not giving us a lot of examples of being very timid and passive and not doing the things he knew he should be doing because the government didn't like it. Like you know, he clearly, uh, died, was killed for his uh, disobedience. Like Daniel, uh, pretty much all of the prophets, like there's just not really, I can't think of an example of someone that would fit the absolutist position, at least not someone in the Bible who's presented in a positive light. Those who are very- That's such an important point. Such an important point because what, what will the absolutists say to your point about Jesus resisting unjust authority? They'll say, oh, well, he's God and we're not God. So Jesus is not a moral example for us. And then, of course, if we go to the Old Testament and I say, well, look, well, Moses defended the Hebrew slave and and in Acts, in Stephen's speech in Acts, he praises Moses for de- defending the Hebrew slave. So that's a moral example for us. People will say, no, the Old Testament, we can't use that because that's the Old Covenant. So you can't use the Old Testament because that's the Old Covenant. And Jesus, we can't follow him as an example because he's God and we're not. So what's the result of that? The result is basically they've edited out all all parts of the Bible using convenient, different and convenient uh, hermeneutical devices. And in effect, what have they what have they made the standard then? The standard is now just this sort of assumption of passivity that isn't anywhere in the Bible. They're starting with a premise that's nowhere in the Bible and using that to override the entirety of the Bible from the the old covenant to the new covenant. Right, and we gain nothing from that. Like it's not only not supported by the Bible, but that doesn't actually encourage Christians to be the type of people that we are called to be. Like being courageous, being 
uh, knowing that you should and you can stand up for what is right, not fearing the government, not fearing, you know, what man can do to you. Like, it just seems like this position doesn't, like, what I guess what you get is you get to feel good about your passivity? Is that the reward? I'm trying to figure out. I mean, obviously, culturally, it's terrible. Like, it's right. a it's, slow it slide. It's convenient for you in the moment, right? Yeah. Now, ultimately, it's going to be most convenient for you to carry out God's will, to resist injustice. You're going to, by doing that, you're going to be helping to bring about a world that's better for you to live in and better for your children, for the people you care about to live in. You're going to be carrying out your duty to the least of these. But in the moment, of course, it always feels easier to people to be cowardly and to avoid conflict. That's why there are cowards. You know, if it wasn't, if it didn't feel easier and more intuitive, people would all be brave and courageous. They wouldn't be cowardly. And yet they are cowards. And oh, here comes this very convenient interpretation of the Bible that just very coincidentally starting you know from a premise that's not anywhere in the bible happens to baptize what people think is easy and convenient and it just happens to tell them that that's the appropriate and godly thing to do and you know I, i've made this point before but you take any example of some horrible thing happening and people stand around and don't intervene you know if, if you don't people will nitpick about the kitty genovese case but that's kind of the archetypal example of this and we can all think of other examples similar to that, where something horrible happened, bystanders stood around and did nothing. The thing about all those stories, and they've happened throughout all of human history, no one needed to teach those people Romans 13 absolutism to get them not to intervene. No one needed to teach them pacifist philosophy or like Buddhism or ahimsa or like negation of the self. No one needed to teach them anything. Cowardice is just what comes most naturally and easily to the fallen human heart and it's what people naturally want to do and here come you know pietistic views like this romans 13 absolutism to say oh isn't it nice by the way not only is this what you naturally want to do but this is what god wants you to do and yeah. it, interestingly that doesn't seem to be how god's will ever works in any <laughs> other situation in right the Bible. right doesn't have any good outcomes. We don't have any examples of that. It's well, and you know, what it was encouraging is many, many people did like that comment that I wrote on Mike Winger's video. So I think that those who do study the Bible and Mike Winger, great Bible teacher, like we've said, like, I don't know what his fuller belief is on obe obeying well, the government. He's an apologetics guy. I seem right. to do a lot of like natural theology stuff. So, yes. you know, it's no, it's not necessarily bad that he doesn't focus on political philosophy in the Bible. I mean, not everyone needs right. to focus on that. So yeah. my, my guess would be if he thought about it a bit more and we kind of could talk to him and, and draw out the implications of what he's saying, he probably would end up being kind of closer to our position. But I think I he think would agree. Default for a lot of Christians is to sound sort of like, you yes. know, basically, unless you're commanded to murder someone, do, do whatever the state says. Yes. Well, maybe he'll see this because he shared one of our memes once. Do you remember that? He shared our, he shared our passive. Oh yeah, that's right. I do remember I think that. he yeah. shared our Christian passivity meme, right? Maybe is that the right meme or the agreeable it disposition was, uh, one? He, sh he shared a meme that we made of uh, a non-Christian saying to a Christian, you need to be nicer by, you know, by which I mean, passively agree with everything that I'm saying and don't, don't be, you know, so hostile. Right, because Jesus would want you to be nice, and by nice, I mean a, a, agree with and conform to whatever I tell you to. Right, that is one. Of, that is a good meme. Yeah. <laughs> That's a classic. Well, maybe since he sees Stacio's stuff, maybe he'll see this one. Well, big fan, Mike. Big fan. Just want to expand the conversation. As always, thank you so much, Ian. Learned a lot. Pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Carmen.